We praise and we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Lord, uh, your faithfulness to us, dear Lord, as we go about our business in this land of your enemy, uh, as we go about going to work, going about doing this and that, things that we have to do, uh, Lord, you're there. And um, above the distractions of the earth, you sit enthroned. We're so happy that everything is open to your divine survey. And from your great and calm eternity, you order that which your providence sees best for us. Even sometimes when things don't make sense, when disappointments come, help us to remember that all things are working together for our good. Yes, even those things that may be disappointing, those things that, Lord, may rub us the wrong way. If we're your children, everything is working for our good. And we thank you for that. Thank you, dear Lord, for being the God who sometimes allows us to come to the place of crisis so that you can show yourself and reveal your glory. Tonight, Lord, I pray for every one of us who has joined, those who are joining, those who are present, dear Lord, in the house, those who are present uh, 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 via Zoom. We are asking for special blessing, Father. And just, Lord, I want everyone to know here publicly that, Father, it is not me, it is Jesus, it is Christ, it's the Holy Spirit. And if he wasn't here, dear Lord, I would just be making noise. And uh, I wouldn't make any sense at all. Hi. I ask for a fresh anointing, Father, a fresh anointing to overflowing. Not only for myself, but for those who are listening. Bless us, dear Lord. And may our hearts throb and burn as we listen to the words of Scripture. We pray. Help the light of prophecy to shine bright in our minds. And as a result, dear Lord, let things become clearer, we pray. In the wonderful name of your Son, amen, amen. All right, all right. Uh, we're going to get started with our study. And before I start sharing my screen here, I want to make sure that... Um, where were we starting tonight? We're going to start where we ended last week. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. Let's see. Okay. All right. Slant. 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 All right. We're going to start. Yeah. That's where we're going to start. Okay. All right, I'm going to encourage you all, uh, if you have any questions as we're moving along from time to time, I'll stop periodically to ask if there's any questions so far regarding what we've studied. And I encourage you to ask the questions. Don't worry. Don't, you're not going to, you'll never offend me by asking questions. I love questions. Amen. I am just a humble messenger, just delivering the mail. And if there's anything I can clear up, I am happy to do that. Amen. All right. Okay. Uh, I'm going to move something here out of the way and i'm going to grab my pen here real quickly i see that we have lilia and carmina jason we have angie angie we missed you last week but i suspect it's because there was the whole uh what you call it um password fiasco and a lot of people didn't make it, but it's so good to see you. That's right. Cora, I see you. I see Melissa. And I see Shauna. And where there is smoke, there is fire. So there's Shauna, there's Jason. And there is, I see there is Bobby D. Uh, who else is there? I see Kaylin. Uh, if you're Kaylin. Ah, okay. Excellent. All right. So I'm just be calling your name instead of going and go, well, who's next? I'm not going to be saying that. I'm just going to make sure that everyone is. And I'm even also going to include Justin. I see his name there. Could be Justin. It could be Julie. Somebody there. So anyway, here we are. We're going to launch in our study. Are we ready? I think we are. Okay. Okay, so we are in the book of Revelation, 
And I want to just recap something I said last week, that when, when a nation, a nation uh, qualifies for mention in prophecy, when number one, it has uh, had a, um, a significant influence uh, upon the people of God. The nation is, number one, uh, global in its influence. Secondly, at the same time, has had an influence, an impact on the people of God at any one time. Uh, and we're not talking about just a brief, you know, fleeting, uh, you know, sort of casual contact. We're talking about an influence uh, with the people of God. That nation is mentioned in prophecy. For instance, let me ask you real quickly. Did the kingdom of Egypt ever have an influence on God's people at all? Oh, yeah. Yes. When was that? Well, the time of the... Uh... When they were there for 400 years. Well, when they were there for 400 years, the children of Egypt. Oh, come on, sis. You can't be calling me at this time. This is my sister. Hang on one second. Hello. Hey, I'm in, I'm in Bible study right now. I'll give you a call. Hello. I, I'm in Bible study. I'll give you a call when I'm done. Are you there? Hello. Hello. Can you hang on? Hey, hey, I'm in, I'm in Bible study right now. I'll give you a call when I'm done. Oh, all right. My sister all the way back when? <laughs> Calling me. That's Erica's mom. Okay. Um, so, so, so Egypt had something to do with God's people. Are they in scripture? Oh, yeah. yes. yes, they are. Okay. Did Babylon ever have anything to do with God's people? Sure. Absolutely. Sure. Took them captive for 70 years. And so are they in scripture? Yes, they are. And then, of course, Medo-Persia, because the, the children of Israel were there until the Medo-Persian kingdom. Anybody familiar with a book called Esther? Esther is in the context of the Medo-Persian kingdom. Okay? So Daniel, everyone was in the you know, kingdom of Babylon in Medo-Persia. Uh, uh, and, of course, the Greeks had something to do with God's people. The Romans had something to do with God's people. Our Lord was born, and he grew up, and he was crucified. And the Assyrians. And the Assyrians, that's right. All of those nations. Now, those were not the only nations that, that had ever existed. They were not the only powerful nations that ever existed. But these nations had something to do, an impact on God's people. Now, has, a, does, does, has America had anything to do with God's people? <laughs> About the pilgrims coming to this land so that they can have freedom. Okay? Was, is, is that big enough? It is. Okay, so America did that. This is the place where... Protestants ran, those pilgrims ran away from the tyranny of Rome. And had it not been for this country, they probably would have been extinguished over there in Europe. And so this country becomes this uh, place where the children of God run to. And they, you know, they found this nation that we found last week um, is a nation that allows freedom. Freedom, not just freedom of religion, but freedom of expression. Liberty, both civil and religious, right here. But according to the Bible, this nation that is pictured in the book of Revelation chapter 13, beginning with verse 11, um, this nation that has two horns like a lamb, okay? Horns like a lamb, meaning it's young, it's usual, it, it comes up right uh, at the same time, at the time when the first beast that we've been talking about all the way since Daniel, all the way since we left Revelation, remember when we were talking about the first seal, the second seal, the third seal, all that, the first horseman, second, white horse, red horse, black horse, okay, pale horse. Uh, we got around to the pale horse period, and we found there that depicted the, uh, 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 the long years of persecution, papal persecution, paganism and Christianity coming together. In the, in the papacy, in the form of a papacy, to persecute God's children. And uh, that was the Dark Ages. A lot of history there. Uh, a lot of history that you don't, you just can't go to, uh, to uh, 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 the bookstore and, and buy. You have to actually look for these books and find them. Okay, and there's a reason for that, and we'll find out why you can't find that history anywhere. Why it is that you can find the history of Hitler uh, persecuting and murdering some 7 million Jews. You can find that, but you can't find the history of the papacy murdering between 50 
and 100 million Christians during the Dark Ages. Why well, you can't find that? We're, we're going to be finding that out in a little bit. So now the papacy rules from 538, okay, when Vigilius uh, becomes the first pope, Justinian, the emperor of Rome, gives him the authority to correct heretics, okay? And when Constantine before him had moved the capital to Constantinople, the seat of Rome, the area of Rome was left vacant. The most powerful person there was the Bishop of Rome. And so he was made the corrector of heretics. And so later on, um, uh, around 538, becomes so powerful and the uh, papacy, what we know to today as the, as the kingdom of the popes begins around that time. They reign for a period of, of uh, uh, 1,260 years all the way to 1798. And when we studied last week, we found in a previous study that the one of his heads would suffer, sustain a deadly wound, which would later heal. We found that in 1798, Napoleon sent his general, Berthier, to uh, Rome. He took Pope Pius VI prisoner, took him all the way to France. And uh, the papacy there was considered by many in Europe to be dead. Many thought that that was it. That was a deadly wound. But we're told that the deadly wound would be healed. And uh, last week, I forgot to show you something. Uh, in uh, 1929, Mussolini, who was an Italian dictator, signed the, uh, oh, what was it called? It was called the, uh, it was a treaty that was signed in 1929. Uh, again, uh, um, uh, 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 recognizing the papacy, the Vatican, as an independent city-state. That's when the Vatican began to become an independent city-state. And today in Rome, even though the Vatican is in Rome, I don't know if you all know this, but it's, in an, it's an independent city-state. It is actually the smallest nation in the world. The Pope is its president. Okay, you need a visa to go to the Vatican. Okay, so it's an independent state. In fact, uh, Ronald Reagan is the first to have sent uh, the uh, first ambassador from the United States to the Vatican to represent this nation. And of course, we have what are called papal nuncios to almost every nation in the world. So this is a strange kind of unique church that has actually is recognized by all the other political nations and they have representatives in, in there and it in turn has representatives in every country of the world. The Baptist church doesn't have that capacity, nor does the Pentecostal church or any other church in the world. This is that horn that rose among the 10 that was different from the rest of them. How different? Because it was religious, it was a religious political nation, amen? You know that, that when they meet in the United Nations from time to time, the Pope addresses them. You don't have ever seen Billy Graham address the United Nations or anything like that. He goes there in his capacity as the leader of the Vatican. So now, when the papacy sustained that deadly wound in 1798, when the Pope was taken to Rome, to, to France, and he died in a city called Valence in France, um, in 1798, we're told that in Revelation chapter 10, uh, the deadly wound was sustained. And in chap verse 11, the very uh, next verse, Another beast is seen coming up out of the earth at the same time. So around 1798, we looked at this nation that has two horns that we found represent, number one, uh, youthfulness. It's coming up, not out of the water in populated areas, but in sparsely populated areas from far from east, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the uh, Western Europe, the United States rose to become a nation that would gain global prominence, influence, and power. So we're going to look at that a little bit here tonight and continue with that. So now notice here, it says, he uh, exercises all, notice this, the authority of the first beast before him. This nation, the United States, will exercise all the authority of the first beast in his presence. Let me stop here for a minute. In Revelation chapter 13, same chapter, divided in two, there are two beasts. There is the beast with seven heads and 10 horns. That is a composite of the beast we saw in Daniel, okay? It is a beast that is a blasphemous power. 
And we're told that the dragon here representing primarily Satan, but in a secondary sense representing the Roman pagan Roman Empire. We saw that they, they had as their ensigns, they had the dragon ensign. So the, the dragon would give this papal beast its, its seat and its power and its great authority. Think about that for a minute. It's a union of church and state that receives its power and authority, not from God, but from the devil. Isn't that amazing? From the devil in a primary sense, but in a secondary sense, they actually took the place of old pagan Rome. So papal Rome succeeds pagan Rome. And if you study, by the way, if you weren't here last week, um, I said something that I want to reiterate again. Whenever we talk about a church here, uh, and in this case, we mentioned the Roman church, we are not talking about the people. This is nothing against the people at all. As we, as we basically unfold the truth here, as we break it down, it's necessary to make sure that we break it down just as it is. Amen? And so it's not anything against the people. It's the system that we're talking about. Are you with me? And so this power receives, this, 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 this church receives its power from the, it says the dragon gave the beast his seat, and his power and his great authority. I want you to think about that for a minute. Jesus said, all power is given unto me in heaven and, and earth. Who gave him that power? His father. We know that. But the Antichrist imitates Christ. So it too receives power from someone. All authority. And the dragon, Satan primarily, and then pagan Rome, gave the beast, the papacy, his power, his seat and his great authority. That's why when we look at some of the things we were looking at the week before last, that they can say that uh, the, the church, the Catholic church is above the Bible. And the Pope is another God on earth. And we're gonna look at tonight that, uh, you know, at another title that he gives himself that will give us a clue to something that I believe is very powerful that a lot of people wonder about. So now, America, would exercise the authority of the first beast, meaning Rome, papal Rome, that received a deadly wound. So if America gets to the place where they exercise all the power of the papacy, is America at that time a good and friendly and benevolent power, or is it dangerous? If America was to do that, anyone that copies or imitates the papacy and exercises all the power of the first beast of the present in his presence. Notice what he does. And he causes, that means enforcement. The earth, not just here United States. Later on, this right here is a superpower. Again, another feature. This power here is a superpower because notice, it causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Make no mistakes, my friends that one day America, we're told here, that it would lead out and it would empower, it would, it would, it would take the position of actually seconding and causing and forcing in some way, form or shape, the world to worship the papacy. We're gonna see that. That the world's most powerful superpower will one day work with the papacy in order to give power to it. So let's move on and see what we can glean some more. Um, so to speak, we found means legislation to, and to cause means enforcement. So there will be some legislation here in this country. And in, and in that legislation, people will be enforced. Now you notice when you have a law, you have to enforce it, right? There's no such thing as a law that you can sort of either keep or follow if you want or you don't want. This, this is going to be religious intolerance in this nation. We talked about lying wonders and miracles for a little bit, but I'd, I'd like for us to kind of sort of go through this for a little bit. So I'm gonna read these two verses here, and then I'm going to uh, start with uh, Lilia, Carmina, Jason, Angie, Cora, Melissa, Shauna, Jason, Bobby, Kaylin, and Justin, and then we're gonna come to the room here in our study. All right, notice it says here, he performs great signs so that he even makes what? Come down from heaven. Fire coming down from heaven. Now, would that be a big miracle? Yes. That is a huge miracle. 
it from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Notice this. And he, what's that word? Deceive. What is the pur purpose of these miracles? To deceive those who dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Now, if he is performing miracles, and they are huge, and it is said that he is granted power to do these miracles, and the miracles are for the purpose and intent of, of deceiving who gives him this power. Satan. It's Satan. We're about to see that in no uncertain terms. You're going to see the word speak. And you're going to see tonight, and I hate to disappoint you, but God, uh, even though he, the Bible says, by him, princes rule and kings decree justice, the world in which we live today, my friends, is a corrupt world. Is a corrupt world. The leaders who bind themselves in secret societies are not there in secret worshiping God. Are you with me? We're going to move on. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make a what? An image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. Ha! Ah. So the way that people are going to worship the beast, the papacy, is not by worshiping it directly, but in worshiping what is referred to here as an image of the beast. An image. So as you worship the image, you're worshiping the papacy. Amen? An image is a representation of something. So if you worship that image, you're really actually worshiping whatever it represents. Are you with me? Now notice this. Um, we're going to talk about these signs and wonders. Lilia, if you're there, could you please read for us verse 13 of Revelation 16? Is Lilia there? All right. Lilia may have gone to the kitchen okay. to take a bite. And I saw, okay. Oh, I'm here. Okay. And I saw Revelation 16, 13, and 14. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Wow. Are these good spirits? Bad. Where, where are they coming out of? What is the first thing mentioned? Out of the mouth of the? Dragon. Who is that primarily? The dragon. Okay. John, don't forget that. The dragon Satan. represents Satan. Satan. But in this sense, going forward, it also represents paganism. What does it represent? In a secondary Satan. sense, paganism. So paganism, mingling with Christianity in these last days, out of the beast. The beast, of course, is Catholicism, and it claims to be Christian, and also claims to be it mingles Judaism, Christianity, and paganism, and all kinds of other aspects. And the false prophet. We're going to see in another study that the false prophet represents Protestantism in its apostate state. Protestantism or Protestantism in its fallen condition. How do they fall? We're going to see this as we move on in the book of Revelation. It's going to speak very clearly, and you're going to see that. So there's going to be this um unholy trinity you notice that the dragon the beast and the false prophet everything that god does you know there's a holy trinity the devil imitates there this is a counterfeit okay for the purpose of deception you're going to see that in the very next verse carmina please for they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Okay, so these spirits that are coming from uh, 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 the mouth of the dragon and there are the union of apostate Protestantism and Catholicism and paganism mingled together. Where are they going first? They go forth unto the what? Somebody tell me. The third sentence. Where are they going? Kings. Kings, the kings of, the, of the earth. Of the earth. Just part of the earth? Uh, the, the fourth sentence? How, how, what part of the earth? The whole world. The whole world. The devil is interested in just part of the world or the whole world? The whole in world. In the whole world. This whole world that God created, I take you back to our very first study when we started, started studying. We realized and we found out that Lucifer was kicked out of heaven because he wanted to be like God. He wanted to be worshipped. There was war in heaven. He didn't just leave. 
there was war. He was kicked out. And when he was kicked out, he determined that when he came to this world, he would deceive human beings. And at last, his purpose and his aim and his intention is that every human being on planet Earth will worship him, thinking they're worshiping God. You see, the very essence of deception is that you don't know you're being deceived. Amen? When somebody deceives you, they give you something that looks like what you really want. Amen? Amen. Am I speaking clearly? Yes. <laughs> so that when you do go out there and somebody gives you a fake dollar note, it looks exactly like the real deal to make you think that it's the real deal. So the worship in this last days is something we need to be very, very careful about. In that, the overarching principle that the devil works with and philosophy is that of deception watch they first go not to the pop uh, 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 populace they go to the kings of the earth the leaders if they can go to the leaders then the leaders can influence their people amen they, they can influence their people okay now and the purpose is to gather them to the battle of the great day almighty. All the world. This is important, guys. Let's move on. Jason, can you read the next verse, please? Let me, let's go on. These are the words of our Savior. And what did he say in Matthew 24, 24? Jason. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if we were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. I want you to mark those words. Those are words straight from the mouth of Jesus, our Lord, the one who hung on the cross and he died for you and I. Everything he speaks, he speaks in love. Everything he says is salvific and redemptive. Amen? He never says anything to put anybody down. He says, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Amen? He loved us so much that he did not give up all the way to the death, the shameful death of the cross. And he warned us right before he died. He says, in the last days, in the days that you and I are living in, he says, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets. These are false teachers. I wish I had time today. I could take you to Corinthians chapter 11 and show you there a place that says that even the devil, no marvel, for the devil himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed into ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So let me say this to you. The devil has ministers. The devil has pastors. Amen? And look, do you think they just uh, pastor in the church of Lucifer? Oh, no, 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 no. Remember, deception is the key. So they are in Christian churches today. Amen? And oh, no, how are you going to know? Oh, because they, they, they have the pentagram on their head? No, 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 no. Because they have a, a, a set of horns, if you look carefully? No, 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 no. Remember, it's deception. You, I can't deceive you with a $20 bill that looks like a, 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 a peso. 20 pesos, making you think it's a $20 bill. It has to look like a $20 bill. So the ministers have to look like the real deal. And so the devil realizes that, look, if I want to poison, if you want to poison someone, you can't just put a jar of uh, cyanide in front of them and say, have this. I want you to die. Unless you're a fool, you're not going to take it. But if I give you, if you come to my house and I supposedly I was that nefarious and evil, and I decided I didn't like you, and I just give you a tall glass of cold orange juice on a hot day like this, and I put a drop of cyanide. Mm. Do you think you might take it unawares? You might do that, especially because you have confidence you think we're friends. Mm -hmm. God forbid that I should ever do, do something like that. But I'm just using that to try to, to, to point out something, that the devil is not your friend. And not everybody who says they're your friend is your friend. Not everybody who simply is preaching some truth is preaching all the truth. Because the devil knows this one thing, that if you can just mingle some truth and then you put in some untruths in it, people will take it hook, line, and sinker. Amen? We don't want to do that. That's why I teach you to always have your Bibles. Always see what the Bible is saying. Don't come here to say, well, we know, we trust George now. He can just tell us what the Bible says. 
I can, I can guarantee you I fear God enough to not ever, I'd rather not teach than to fear people. Amen? But I can tell you that you shouldn't put your trust in a human being, including myself. You trust in God. Is that fair enough? Now, so they shall show great signs and wonders in so much. This is Christ saying this. If it were possible, they shall, they shall deceive even the very people of God. So don't ever say, well, you know, I'm in Christ. I don't really care. No, 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 no. You owe it to yourself to study the word of which Christ said, or concerning which Christ said, man does, does not live by bread alone, but by every word. Amen? So don't be content with just a little bit of the truth. You want to know all the truth. Amen? Amen. In fact, I'm going to tell you a story. You know, um, uh, I, I heard this story about, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, one of the banks in the country uh, uh, every year sends its uh, tellers to Washington, D.C. on this seminar that they go out there and they go out to study to learn how to better identify fake bank notes. You know, they want them to be able to tell without the aid of that light or the pen they use and all that. They want them to be able to, just when they see it, they can tell it's a fake banknote. And you would think that tellers who deal with money every day, they always just deal with money, that they would know. But, you know, uh, counterfeiters have gotten really good nowadays. So they take them, every, every little trick that they learn, they want to make sure that the bank tellers know this. So one day, they, 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 they go for this uh, one-week seminar. And on their way back, one of the tellers says, you know, remarked and said, you know what? It's amazing. We, go, we went this, for a whole week studying about fake, how to identify uh, counterfeit money. And not once did they show us counterfeit money. You know, I'm just thinking about this. And then one, one after another in the airplane, they said, you know, that's true. We never, not one time. And then there was a, 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 their manager, we in the back, was quiet. And he says, you know why? That was not unintentional. Is that the purpose is that you are uh, acquainted with every detail, every minute detail of real currency, genuine currency, that you study the real thing so well that they know that after you look at it, as soon as the fake note appears on the horizon, you know it. In other words, you learn the truth not by studying falsehood. You learn the truth by exposing yourself to the word of God, learning it, studying it, becoming acquainted with it. You can become so acquainted with it that if a minister is preaching, either on television or anywhere else, and you hear something, you're like, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. Why? Because you're acquainted with the truth. Are we together? So now, notice what it says here in verse 13, 8. As a result of these deceptions, guys, where the kings of the earth are gathered together, they're deceived, and then now they're deceiving their own. This is why this is so dangerous when you see leaders doing certain things that you don't always get yourself involved too much in politics. Let me tell you something. You can be lost in that way. Our faith and our hope are to rest in God. Can you say amen? Okay, let's hear uh, Angie. Angie, can you read for us verse 13, 8? What is the result of these deceptions? And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Amen. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. I say amen to your reading, not to what we're saying here, because this is really bad. I wish this wouldn't happen. But he says, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. The prophet John, looking ahead at this time, saw, as it were, the whole world worshiping the beast. It was like the whole world. The people that weren't worshiping the beast were so few that it looked like you could hardly tell where they are. And you, 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 gotta, you had to look closely. And we're going to see why that is, okay? Now, uh, we're moving on, and I want Cora to read what comes next. We're going to start talking about the image of the beast because we read about the image of the beast that would be... Uh, uh, um, created and people would worship it. And before you read this, Cora, let me just go through this quickly because I think we saw this last week. He deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make a what? An image, image. To, the, to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So if you're worshiping the image, according to this verse, who are you worshiping? Okay. If you notice, it's an image to the Yes. Ultimately, you're worshiping Satan. That, you know, but Satan is very smart, Alice. He knows not to come in person and tell people to worship him. 
Okay? When we worship God, we worship him through whom? Through Jesus. That's right, right? If we recognize the Son and we worship him, we accept God. If we reject the Son, we reject God. On the same token, if we worship the image of the beast, we are really worshiping the beast, and the beast was given power by Satan. So who are we ultimately worshiping? Satan. The Satan knows that. Is this very clear? Yes. Very clear, okay? The dragon beast gave the beast his power, his seat, his great authority. Jesus says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. So go, I'm telling you to go. And as we go, we know that to go because we're obeying the Christ who is given authority by God. So in doing what Christ tells us, we're doing what God tells us. Are we together? And so when you worship the image of the beast, you are worshiping the beast, which is the Roman Catholic power. And in worshiping the Roman Catholic power, you're worshiping the dragon that gave him the power. Is that clear? This is how Satan aims to fulfill his dream of being worshiped in place of God here on planet Earth. And please don't think, well, this is not going to happen to me. Let me tell you something. Our mother Eve was a thousand times smarter than you are. She was created by God. She did not have any inherited tendencies to sin. She was perfect. And she was deceived. Amen? The whole tenor of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is to inculcate distrust in human nature and to encourage trust in divine nature. Can you say amen? Don't trust amen. yourself. The Bible tells us that in the book of Proverbs. You know what? Uh, 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 what does it say? Trust in the Lord with some of your heart. With all of your heart and lean not on, on your own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So there we see that the Bible constantly tells us, don't trust yourself. There is a way that seems right to a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. So we don't follow what we think or what seems right or what other people are suggesting. Man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Is this understandable? So when we worship the image, we are worshiping the beast, the Roman Catholic power. And the Roman Catholic power in worshiping it, we are worshiping the devil who gave it power. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's move on. So he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. We're talking about the United States now. Granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Let me say this in a little bit. How many of you know that the Roman Catholic Church calls itself the Mother Church? Anybody know that? It claims to be the Mother Church. If you know the history of Protestantism a little bit, you will know that nearly all the Protestant uh, ref reformers actually came from Catholicism. That's right, okay? They started pointing out at what she was doing wrong. Martin Luther was actually starting to be a monk, a priest. In Rome, okay, uh, in Germany, but he was, you know, he, he took a pilgrimage to Rome. He wanted to study that. Every single one of them, okay, there wasn't any other religion for a thousand years that you could be a part of. And so today they call themselves the Mother Church. I can show you evidence. In fact, if you Google up the Mother Church, it's the Catholic Church, that's what they claim. And so if you're a mother, it follows you must have what? What does a mother have? Children. Children. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Children. And she claims the Protestants actually belong to them. I'm going to show you tonight Protestants actually saying that. Amen? So, there's coming a time when there's some kind of legislation and whoever does not recognize the beast will be killed. Mm -hmm. I know this sounds crazy, but it's the word of God. I'm just preaching it. I'm not writing it. Amen? All right. O King, remember this? You are this head of gold. Who was that king? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. What kingdom was his? Babylon. Babylon. Babylon was a literal local kingdom. Okay? It was a literal kingdom. But did you know that in Revelation, there is a spiritual Babylon? We're going to see that in our study next week. There is a spiritual Babylon. And the Bible says Babylon is fallen. In fact, we're going to see that Babylon is a church today. It means confusion. Okay? You are this head of gold. Now, Cora, can you read for us what's on the screen? Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. 
he set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Okay. This is Nebuchadnezzar, the one that had a dream, forgot what he dreamed, and you know what happened? Daniel came and he told us, this is what you dream and this is what it means. And he revealed to him that you are the head of, head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar was so upset. What do you mean head of gold? I want to be the whole image. Because Nebuchadnezzar was a proud king. He didn't want, he thought, like all kings think, that his kingdom would last forever. And when God revealed that he was only the head and he would be succeeded by chest and arms of silver, the Medo Persians, and after that there was a he didn't even want to hear anymore. He said, wait a minute. No. So in defiance of God, in the very next chapter, he, he created an image of gold from head to toe. And guess what? He set it up in the plain of Jura. Do you see those three guys standing up? The scripture calls them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why are they famous? Because it says here, Korah, continue. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nation, and languages. Did Nebuchadnezzar have global influence? Yes. Yes, yes. He's talking to not just He's saying peoples, nations, and languages. languages. Yes. Continue, my sister. That. That at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Okay. What are people being told to worship? The golden image. Golden image. Representing who? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, he's not saying come to me and worship me, just worship the image. And in worshiping mm. the image, who are you really worshiping? Nebuchadnezzar the king. This is genius, right? All right. So if you read the story in Daniel 3, I want you to read the whole thing. I just have four verses here. It says here, whoever now, uh, Melissa, whoever. Whoever and whoever does not fail fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Continue. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Ah, we don't have to answer you in this what? Matter. Why? Uh, continue. Let let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Wow, what do you call that? Is that courage? You're not talking to a president. You know, a president implies that uh, the power is with, rests with the people. You're talking to a king, his power is absolute. He says, you bow down and worship. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego recognized that that was a violation, would constitute a violation of the second commandment. Are you with me? The devil hates the law. He doesn't just tell you he hates it directly. No, he does things like this to violate its principles. Worship an image. That's a violation of the first commandment. Do you remember Daniel in the lion's den? They said to Daniel, you have to pray to no other god but the God of the king. Daniel says, no, I can't do that. I will only worship God. Because he recognized that would constitute a violation of the first commandment. Every time the devil tells you to do something that God says don't, it is always something in violation of what? God's law. He hates God's law. Amen? This is how we know he hates God's law. Okay? He says, we're not going to do that. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you read this story, you will find that this man was thrown in a fiery furnace and it was heated seven times. Did they burn? No, 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 no. Christ in heaven says, no, 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 no. I'm not going to send an angel. I'm going myself. Those boys stood up and they said they're going to honor me like that. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm going there myself. And as they were in the fire, King Nebuchadnezzar himself recorded and he says, didn't we throw three men in the fire? And behold, I see four men, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Christ was there with them. Christ identifies himself with all who will honor him at all costs. Do you think, do you think that he will identify with us if we refuse to bow down to the image that he set up? 
if you refuse the mark of the beast and all that, I tell you that he will. And I'm going to give you some uh, 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 proof here in a little bit. Now, in Daniel, we have a local and a literal interpretation. In Revelation, we have a global and a spiritual application. So in Daniel, we have a Babylon. And we have an image of, of, uh, of uh, uh, that they have to worship. In Revelation, we have a Babylon. And we have an image. In Daniel, it's local and it's literal. In Revelation, it's spiritual, meaning we're not going to all be called San Francisco or some place in Sacramento to go down to bow down to an actual image. Are you listening? But it would constitute in the enforcement, in some kind of legislation, that this nation will leading out and then followed by the rest of the world, something that constitutes, if in obedience to it, something that constitutes an acknowledgement of the authority of the papal see and therefore of the devil. Are you with me? It has to do with authority. Okay? And because there's so many people that, you know, uh, some of you miss Bible studies here and there, if we all have been studying together, it would make sense what I'm saying today. Amen? Because um, God seal is placed by God himself on the foreheads of every one of his children. In Revelation chapter 7, we read about of four angels holding the four winds, north, east, west, and south. Amen? They're holding the four winds of strife, of human passion. They're holding right now. It says, until we seal the servants of our, of our God in their foreheads. Did we see that? And we, we discovered that According to the prophet Isaiah, the seal of God is found in God's law, in the heart of God's law. We compared a seal. We went out there. We saw the seal of the president of the United States, the seal of the president of Canada, the seal of so many presidents. It's essentially the same thing. It is something that shows, proves authority. Amen? It shows that it gives the name and the title and the territory of the ruler. Amen? And so in the heart of God's law, when you look at the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment contains the seal. It alone tells, gives us the title and the name and the territory that God rules. You remove that, you take away the seal from the law. Are you with me? So what does the devil do? The devil always counterfeits what God has. So God has a Sabbath that he gave us the creation. He says, honor the Sabbath. For in six days, God made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in it. In, it. in Exodus 31, he says, uh, keep my Sabbath, for this is the sign between you and me that I am your God who sanctifies you. It's a sign of authority. Amen? And when we pause on the Sabbath, we are acknowledging that God, number one, is my creator. Number two, he's the creator of everything. Amen? That, 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 that God warrants and deserves my worship because he's my creator. The devil hates that. So he denotes if you take away the seal from the law, people are going to forget who God is. And pretty soon they're going to start worshiping images. Amen? Now, so that's the trick. The devil then comes along with his own counterfeit. And his counterfeit is not a seal, it's a mark. Where does God place his seal? In the forehead. Where does the devil place his mark? In the forehead and in the hand. Amen? We're going to see that. One of these days we'll talk about just the mark of the beast itself and we'll look at it from scripture and you'll be able to see that. Now, notice he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, notice this, to receive a mark where? All on their foreheads. Hey, in case you're wondering, it's not something people thought, oh, you know, when the barcode came out, people say, oh, that's, that's the mark. When the social security people, uh, numbers were issued, people thought, oh, that's the mark of the beast. No, 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 no. Remember, it's a spiritual application and it has to do with worship. Amen? The devil gives a mark and it's the opposite of God's seal. Amen? You receive it in your forehead or in your hand. I need to take a moment and just talk about this for a minute. It didn't say you receive it on your, on your right hand and on your forehead. It's either or. Do you see that? You either get it on your forehead or where? On head. Number one, why the forehead? The brain is divided into lobes, right? The front part is called the frontal lobe. This is the seat of judgment and decision making. Amen? For years, I worked in a dementia unit. That's where we met, right? Alzheimer's unit and all of that. Do you know what lobe primarily dementia attacks? Right here. 
That's why it affects their decision making, right? And what they can't remember stuff, right? All of that and everything. It, it, it impacts, that's why, you know, uh, they become incontinent and all of that. You know, it is the seat of morality and all of that. This right here is so very important and I wish we could study it. And you could see that I could show you that this is the place somewhere in there where God speaks to human beings. And any place where God speaks to human beings becomes a target of the devil. Dementia is an invention of the devil. Amen? Because we're made in the image of God. And he hates that. And we show that when we think rationally. Amen? And we act rationally. So it pleases the devil when God's creatures are affected to where they can't think. And grown men and women become like children. It pleases the devil, amen? Mm -hmm. And it hurts God, ultimately. Are we together? So the forehead, so when you receive the mark on your forehead, it is a settling. It's something you believe right here. And it is revealed. How do you reveal your, 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 your faith or your belief? By your? Or what else? Your actions. Your actions. The right hand is a symbol of work or action. So there are those who are going to believe it. They have the mark because that's what they believe. That's what they choose to believe. They're deceived. Others will do it out of convenience. They don't believe it. It's just in the hand. They're like, okay, you know, I don't believe it. But if I don't do it, I'm going to lose my job and all of that. You receive it in the hand. Okay? Either way, you receive it. My friends, you don't want the mark anywhere. Are you with me? You want to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You want to stand up and say, no, I will not do that. And I, you can do whatever you want to do to me. Take away my job, do it. My God is going to help me. And even if he chooses not to help me right now, I still am not going to do it. Amen? You want to say like Job, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. Do you recognize that? My dears, I want to tell you this. God sometimes chooses to allow his children to die. He doesn't always have to deliver you in every little thing. He allowed his son to die. He allowed John the Baptist to die in prison, right? He allowed Peter to be crucified upside down. He sometimes allows his children to die. So let's not entertain this sentimental idea that, oh, I'm a Christian, nothing ever bad will ever happen to me. Sometimes when you are suffering, it is then sometimes, sometimes when you glow, can glorify God the most. God can show the difference between how his children patiently can suffer and still believe in him versus how the, the, the world, uh, you know, takes when they're suffering and when they're, when they're in a bad place. Sometimes you can glorify God when you're in trouble. Amen? Amen. So let's move on. Are, are you, is this understandable so far? Okay, notice this now. Uh, Shana. Can you read uh, the verse on the screen? Yes. And that no one might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. The legislation that will be enforced will affect your buying and your selling. What does that mean? It means so many things. Well, let me just say this. I will cover everything. When you go to work, are you selling something? And your services, yes. absolutely. Your talents and your services, you're selling that. If you can't sell, it means you can't work, right? Yes. You can't work. If you can't work, can you buy? It means that there's something that's going to happen, guys, where your buying and your selling will be determined. We have to have some kind of a cashless society to allow this to happen. Things have to be electronic. To where you, in a moment, can be forbidden to buy or sell, whether it's doing a transaction in your bank or even entering to a restaurant or even going into a store. Even in the context of COVID, if you're really reading the news, this is beginning to happen right now. Amen? We'll get into that as we move along. So the mark of the beast is something that will be enforced and those who refuse can buy or sell. Can you see how many people will give up? And for convenience, we'll receive it on their hand. Even though they don't believe it, they say, for convenience's sake, I'm going to get it. We're going to see the consequences of doing that, guys. Okay? The word of God is very clear. What is this we see on the screen? Where is this? Vatican. That's the Vatican. That's right. Yeah, somebody said Vatican. That's right. That's St. Peter's. That's right. 
Okay? Notice what it says here. The church, on the other hand, after doing what? Changing the what? Day of rest from, what do they call it? Jewish. The Jewish Sabbath or what day? Okay, who changed the day of rest? The church. Notice what it says. To the first day, notice this, made what commandment? Third commandment referred to as the Lord said day. And you can find that in the Catholic encyclopedia. Catholic Church tells you this, okay? All right? And there are Protestant ministers that will tell you this is true, okay? Of course, the change from Sabbath to Sunday was her act. And the act, notice this, is a what? Mark of her power and authority. Do you see that? It's a mark of her power and authority in religious matters. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. And the transference of the Sabbath observant is proof of that fact. Guys, I had to tell you this, but they even say it. When you do it, you're doing it in honor of the Pope and not of God. Amen? I mean, I just want you to look at that. I'm not telling you this. I'm just listing these things out for you guys to see. This is it. God, on the one hand, says, listen, he told Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, don't bow down to images. Nebuchadnezzar says, there's an image over there. If you dare not worship it, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. The guy says, we're going to worship God instead of you. You're going to throw in the fiery furnace? That's fine. God's going to save us. And you know what? Hey, he might choose not to save us. We're still not going to do it. That's true worship, my friends. That's who we want to be like. I want to be like Daniel. Oh, you're going to throw me in the lion's den? God help me. But I'm not going to worship the king out of fear. And Daniel, did he have something to lose? At that time, he was the prime minister of Babylon. He had a lot to lose. But he had God at the very top in his allegiance. And the king was second. Amen? I am imploring you guys to love God just like he loved you. He gave his life for you. Turn your life over to him and let him guide you. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Don't, don't, don't do anything out of convenience. Don't accept a religious practice out of convenience because it doesn't cost you anything. Amen? Ah. So the beast is the papacy. The Sunday is the mark of their authority. Therefore, Sunday is the mark of the beast. It's very clear, guys. <laughs> all right? And I'm just saying this in passing. We're going to look at that in depth at a coming study. Now notice this. All that dwell on the earth will worship him. When the Bible says all, and Christ said, there will be such miracles that it will deceive. Not The world is easy, even those who claim to worship and follow God. So we need to make sure that we know what we need what we're doing. Now, this prophecy we found out last week will be fulfilled when America shall enforce Sunday observance. We're going to see this. This is going to happen. I'm telling you this before it happens, when it happens, when we start hearing about it, you know we studied it in the Bible. Let's talk about these strange bedfellows, okay? And uh, here, who's this? Does anybody recognize that man? That's Bush. What is he doing? <laughs> Bowing to the Pope, okay? All right, okay. Who's that? That is Obama, okay? All right, okay. Pope Francis in America. Now, you all remember this. This is not Trump going through Washington, D.C. This is none other than the Pope in Washington, D.C. No other head of state in the world is ever treated like this. This is the Pope. Okay? That's him. Is that him? Yes. That's him in his Pope mobile. That's right. Secret service and everything else for a church leader. Guys, there's something wrong. What do, you, what do you see back there is not butterflies or ashes from the fires that we're having. Those are human beings lining up the streets. That's him. What is he entering? What is that? That is a presidential aircraft. Okay? And he's going in there alone. Okay? The president is not with him. There he is. Okay? Is this man great? Yeah, apparently, there he is. Where is he? In Congress. Okay, all right. He's in Congress, addressing Congress. There he is, the United Nations. There he is. Now I'm going to introduce you to a man here. This man here, his name is Tony Palmer. 
Tony Palmer died not too long ago, but he is an, a, a, a Protestant minister who was working closely with the Pope. And here, Tony Palmer is addressing some 3,000 Protestant ministers. Okay? I want us to listen in. Take a listen. Now, why is it a historian? Because in 1999, the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Lutheran Church signed an agreement that brought an end to the protest. Luther believed that we were saved by grace through faith alone. Amen. But that's not it. The Catholic Church believed that we were saved by works. And that was the protest. In 1999, they wrote this together. Because in the Protestant Church, there are a lot of cheap salvations. People were getting born again, but no fruit whatsoever. And because we didn't even look for fruit, it wasn't the issue. Because it wasn't necessary for salvation. And no, it's not. But it's a good judge if you are saved. So what these two churches did, they put the two definitions together. Listen to it. I'm reading verbatim from the Catholic Vatican website. Justification means that Christ himself is our righteousness. In which we share through the Holy Spirit in accord with the will of the Father. To, together we Catholics and Protestants, Lutherans, believe and confess that by grace alone, in faith, in Christ's saving works, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to good works. All those are ministers, guys, not a congregation. This brought an end to the protest of Luther. Brothers and sisters, Luther's protest is over. It's yours. In 1999, this was signed by the Lutheran Church, the Federation Worldwide. Later, about five years later, the Worldwide Methodist signed the same agreement. But as of today, we still have had no Protestant evangelical that will stand up and sign this agreement to agree with our brothers and sisters that we are saved by grace through faith to good works. And I believe that's something that needs to be fixed. There's a challenge for you. So the protest has been over for 15 years. And I get a bit cheeky here because I challenge my Protestant pastor friends. If there is no more protest, how can there be a Protestant church? Maybe we now we're all Catholics again. <laughs> but we are reformed. We are Catholic in the universal sense. We are not protesting the doctrine of salvation by the Catholic Church anymore. We now preach the same gospel. We now preach you are saved by grace through faith. Alone. The word alone was the argument for 500 years. The word alone is there. You can read it yourself. The protest is over. Are you hearing that, guys? That was spoken several years ago, I think in 2015 or 2014 or something like that. That's long ago. There's been a lot of development since then. The protest, the protest is far from over. It is far from over. What he's trying to tell us there is that everyone there needs just to go back to Rome, the mother, and there's many, many ministers after that that have actually gone back and signed the document. Last year, I believe, uh, was it 2017? It was a monumental year for uh, evangelicals. You know, they, uh, many of them signed a document that they took to Rome uh, with representatives and hand it over to this current Pope here. And so the movement is a fast gathering strength, guys, and the whole world, the Bible says, will worship him. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. It is a number of a man. His number is 600 and what? 66. This calls for wisdom. The one who has, has understanding, let him calculate the number of the beast, 
This is the English standard version. Or it is the number of a man, and his number is six. Six what? Six. Notice here, uh, real quickly, Catholic Father Luci Ferraris in his Latin encyclopedia called Prompta Bibliotheca, whatever, 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 they love this Latin thing, says this, as the blessed Peter was constituted the what? Vicar of the Son of God on earth, so it is seen that the pontiffs, his successors, hold for us in our empire, what is what they call it, the power of supremacy on the earth greater than the clemency of our earthly imperial serenity. What just happened there? I don't know what just happened, but uh, I think we were kicked out real quickly here. Let's see. Uh, let's get out of that. I'm gonna stop. Hang on, my friends, real quickly. We'll get this back here. Are we there? No, we're not, because I'm not sharing. I need to share the screen. And then now I need to share. And uh, here we are. We're back. All right. So, our Sunday visitor, a Jesuit publication, published two admissions that Vicarious Filii Dei is in fact a title for the Pope. Notice this, in November 15, 1914, the title of the Pope of Rome is what? Vicarious Filii Dei. It's a Latin phrase meaning Vicar of the Son of God, a representative of the Son of God here on earth in person, okay? Notice what it says here in this issue. This is inscribed on his mitre, and if you take the letters of his title, printed large, and add them together, they come to what? 666. Six, six. Well, you know, you're probably wondering. Here's another one. Richard Cunningham, 1803 to 1874, wrote, it is to be observed as a singular circumstance that the title Vicarious Filii Dei, Vicar of the Son of God, which the popes of Rome have assumed for themselves and caused to be inscribed over the door of the Vatican, exactly makes the number what? 666, here it is. Vicarious Filii Dei, in Roman numerals, since the Roman Catholic Church, you notice that, Vicarious, you just add them up, and you notice, Vicarious, adds up to 112, Filii, 53, Dei, 501, Add all those together, we're told it is a number of a man in the book of Revelation, and his number is 666. Why did I leave this for last? Because if I just came up this, it's the only proof that the Pope is the Antichrist, you would say, come on. I mean, you probably end up, my name, my, my name, you probably end up with 666. I'm just kidding. But you know, you can add up a lot of names that can come up. But this is the title, not a name of a person, title, the official, where whoever Pope is sitting on the throne has that title, okay? So that's what we want. We're talking about the office, all right? 666, so we've looked at all kinds of things. Now, we come to the end here, but I want to take uh, all of about five minutes and show you something here real quickly that um, I call the importance of this subject, okay? Notice this. First Thessalonians 5, 1 and 6 here, Notice these words, but concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write unto you. Why? For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a what? If in the night. Notice, for when they shall say what? Peace and then what will happen? Sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, Christians, you believers, you're studying this tonight, are not in darkness, notice this, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. Question, is Christ coming gonna be like a thief to everyone? According to verse four, Paul says, you brethren are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You know, a person coming as a thief doesn't, you know, this phrase means here, it's unexpected. It's unexpected and unwelcome. Is a thief welcome? No, it's unexpected. And Christ says that, the Bible tells us that Christ's coming will be to the world as a thief, sudden and unexpected. To the Christian, it will not be sudden and unexpected. Why? Because when the apostles asked him the question in Matthew 24, how shall you know your coming? What shall be the signs of your coming? Christ gave two chapters of signs. He says, this and this will happen, and this and this, and then the gospel will be preached, 
and then the end will come. And you will see me coming in the clouds of heaven. So as Christians who are studying the Bible, especially these books of Daniel and Revelation, we are reading the signs. And when we see certain things happen, begin to happen, when you see fire everywhere that cannot be controlled, everywhere, they just ignite and they, people lose millions and billions of dollars of property lost in a moment. When you see at the same time hurricanes out in the, in, in the ocean, some places are dry as a bone. Others, people are drowning. Other places, you know, at the same time, there is a pandemic. These are all signs of the times, my, my friends. Amen? So what is the importance? You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not do what? Sleep. Don't sleep. If you don't sleep, you won't come as a thief in the night. And we're not talking about going to bed at night. We're talking about spiritual sleeping, okay? Amen? Moving on, importance of the subject. I'm just taking a few of your minutes here. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, 3 to 12. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, meaning the day of Christ, shall not come unless, and I did not italicize it, this is in the Bible, unless the falling away comes first, and notice this, the man of what? Sin be revealed, that son of a perdition. This is the Antichrist that we've been talking about. Who is he and what other characteristics does Paul gives us in Thessalonians? Notice the man of sin who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called what? God, all that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is. When we studied about the Pope of Rome, we, we, we read in the encyclopedia uh, written by one of the eminent saints of the Catholic Church, that the Pope is not a mere man, but it, as it were, God. As it were, God. So he's a person who claims to be God. He claims to be the vicar, the representative of God. Well, that is supposed to be Jesus, and Jesus has the Holy Spirit, not the Pope. Amen? There's only one mediator, according to the book of uh, uh, Timothy. The man, Christ Jesus. Only one mediator. One between us and God. It's not the Pope. Amen? Not the Pope. All right. The coming of the lawless one, notice the Bible calls him lawless because if they're changing laws of God, they're lawless, amen, right? Okay, according to, the, is according to the working of who? Jesus? Satan. With all power, uh, signs, and what kind of wonders? Lying wonders. And with all unrighteous, what? Deception. Now notice this. Among those who perish, follow me carefully here. Why do they perish? Why is all the world going to worship the beast? Because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. It is quite one thing to obey the truth because you are scared or because you have to. It's quite another to love it. Do you know that the truth is not something, it's someone? Did you know that? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The truth is someone, and it's Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. Are we going to love him back? If you can love him back, you show that by keeping his truth. If you love me, keep my commandments. That's what he says. Amen? We can't just give him lip service. We don't obey him, but we're just saying it. That's the, that's the Christianity of today. People are sentimental about things. Oh, I love God. Well, okay, well, how, how do you prove it? How is it evident that you love him? Do you obey him? Do you keep his commandments? You just keep some of them. Do you keep all of them? Amen? James tells us if you keep all and you break one, you're guilty of? Oh, the devil knows that. So mark this. The devil is not going to tell people to hate God's law and throw it away. He's going to mess with one of them. Because he knows that one truth that all Christians should know. That if you break one, you're guilty of all. Amen? Now, moving on here. It says this. And for this reason, this I always find very, very, very unique. God will send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. If God, after giving you his truth over and over, all you're trying to do is find a way around the truth uh, to, for convenience. If you're studying convenience because you don't want to sacrifice for God, God reads that in the heart. And one day he will say, okay, he, how does he send delusion? It's not, God has no deception that he can send you. It is God that shields us from deception. What this is saying and implying is that God will remove his hand and protection. And allow the devil to deceive you because that's what you've taken and chosen. Am I making any kind of sense tonight, my, 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 my uh, dears? Notice what Revelation says here. 
Here we're going to find the, I'm telling you, this section, I entitled it, The Importance of the Subject. Let me forewarn you. This right here is the most severe warning in all the Bible. And I don't say that just to say that. You can study from Genesis to Revelation. This is the most severe anywhere to be found. And it is a warning against receiving the mark and bowing down to the image. Notice, and the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, why am I reading? Why don't I ask Jason to read that? Jason, help me out. And when Jason, you're done, Bobby D, get ready, and Kalen and Justin. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, uh -huh. the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Uh -huh. And he shall be tormented with the fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. What is this warning against? Guys, if any man worship the beast or his image or receive his mark in his forehead or where, but on his hand, the same will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. Why did I say this is the most severe? Because nowhere else in the Bible do we see God's wrath without mixture. What does that God's wrath without mixture mean? God's wrath always in the Bible, wherever seen, is always mixed with mercy. It's always mingled with what? Mercy. That means God never just destroys people and leaves no one. In the time of Noah, we see God's wrath. He destroyed the whole world, left eight people. In the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, he destroyed all those cities, and there were but three people that were saved. It's always mingled with mercy. Amen? That the world is not destroyed. It's not destroyed. People then come back, and they repopulate, and all of that. But this wrath, my friends, this is the final wrath of God. And it is the most severe because it constitutes behind it, it is a worship of the devil. And when we worship that, and when nations align with themselves with him, they pretty much identify themselves with the devil. God will have no other recourse than to destroy the world. What is the wrath of God? It will be preceded by a series of plagues called seven Last plagues, that's what they're referred to. And they're found in the book of Revelation chapter 16. Seven last plagues. We're going to look at them one of these days soon. And a lot of people have been deceived into thinking that, oh, when those come, I will be raptured away. I'll be in heaven. I don't have to worry about that. I am here to uh, uh, posit to you tonight that that is a deception of the devil himself. No, 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 no. Read that very carefully. Revelation 16. No such thing. God's people are going to be right here on earth when those plagues fall. But God will shield them from those plagues. And David in Psalm 91 said, because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, your habitation, there shall no evil befall you, neither any plague come near your house. In Egypt, right before they left, the people of God were in Egypt when all those plagues one by one fell. They weren't out in the wilderness. They were in Egypt. But they were saved through the plagues. And when the last plague fell, when the angel of death came and, and slew the firstborn, it was not until that last plague came and it took the lives of the Egyptians who did not worship God, who did not have the blood of the lamb on their doorpost, that the children of Israel were then sent out and they left Egypt, the house of bondage. It, similarly, it will not be until the plagues fall, every last one of them here on earth, and we are kept through them, that Christ will come to deliver his people and take them home. Are you with me? God is able to keep his people. One of the biggest deceptions, my friend, is that Christians are told today that you're not going to be here during a time they call a time of tribulation. You're going to be in heaven. Let me tell you something. This is singularly the number one cause why so many Protestants have no interest in the book of, in the book, by, uh, book of Revelation. They say, it's not gonna, we're not going to be here, so we don't need to understand this. If I don't understand it, that's fine. I won't be here. But it's a deception. If you're not here, then why is the devil sitting here just, you know, bothering with people who just, oh, well, yeah, the deception is that, oh, yeah, they're given a second chance and then they're saved. 
I remember a friend of mine who told me that once a friend came and uh, they were sitting there and some Jehovah's Witnesses came and they said to them, you know, yeah, you know, and they, after telling them about all these plagues, one of the friends asked, wait a minute, I want to ask you a question. Uh, isn't there going to be a second chance given to uh, the people that are going to be living in the earth? The man says, yes. And then before he could say, he said, yeah, yeah, then I don't want to listen to you. I'll take my chance then. If there's a second chance, I don't have to listen to you today. I'll wait until then. That is a deception. There is no second chance, my brothers and sisters. Amen? You're not going to find that anywhere in the book of God. So we're almost done here. Okay, give me one more minute. The smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest, no day or night, who worship the beast, his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Is this pretty clear? Is the warning clear? Don't receive it. There is no chance when you receive it. Amen? Now, I don't know why this is going on. Okay, here's the, notice this. There's going to be some Shadrachs, Meshachs, and Abednego. Here they are. In the midst of a world that is worshiping the, the beast, here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. These are the, the few, the remnant. Just like Noah in the ark with the eight people, like, like Lot and his few children who left, like Caleb and Joshua, who alone were saved out of the two million people who left Egypt, there's going to be a remnant that is going to be saved. Why? Because they're special or because they believe some special thing? No, 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 no. Because they stand up and they say, wait a minute, uh-uh, we are going to keep the commandments of God. If you tell us to bow down before the image, that a, constitutes a violation of the law of God, second commandment. If you tell us to keep Sunday, that's a violation of the fourth commandment. We're not going to do that. Oh, we're not going to buy or sell? Fine. We're not going to do it. If we can't buy ourselves, if you take away my house, if you take our property, go ahead and do it. These will be the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They will be with nothing. They will recognize, they will follow their Lord wherever he goes, because while he was on the cross, did he have anything? Did he have any earthly thing? Whoa, my Lord didn't even have a simple little robe to cover his private parts. He was there hung naked. He had nothing on the cross. And yet we want to study convenience. We, don't, we want to go to heaven, supposedly, the easy way. While we're carrying, I want to drive my Lexus there, or my Mercedes, or whatever it is you have, you know? I, 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 don't, I don't want to, we're not going to get it. There's not two ways to heaven. Christ says, I am the way. And you got to follow me. Pick up your what? Your Lexus and follow me. Is that what he says? Does he say, pick up your Tesla? Is that what he says? or whatever it is you drive, or wherever you, you live, and follow me. He said, no, pick up your cross and follow me. Every one of us has a cross. Amen? Amen? I saw something like the sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who had victory over the what? And what else? What else? And the number of his? Now notice, they're standing on the sea of glass. They have victory over these things. Notice, standing on the sea of glass having the hearts of God, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Uh, and notice this. Uh, then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out your bowls of wrath, of the wrath of God on the earth. Here it is, the wrath of God. Mingle without, unmingled with mercy. So the first went, notice the wrath of God on whom it fell. These are the seven last plagues. They're going to fall right here. And you and I are going to be right here. But you can escape them if you stand with God and decide, no, I'm not going to be moved. I'm going to do whatever you tell me. I'm going to follow the lamb wherever he goes. Amen? Even though it cost me my life. Notice this. He poured his bowl upon the earth, and a foul, loathsome sore came upon the men, notice, who had the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. <sighs> wow. Gosh, this is the last one here. I saw thrones, and they sat on them. Judgment was committed to them. And then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness of Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his on their what? Foreheads. What does it say in the bottom? And they lived and did what? Reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Let me tell you something. That's why Christ to the seven churches continues to say again and again, he who overcomes, he who overcomes. My friends, this is the test that is coming upon you and I, and we must overcome this. So in closing, I want to say this. I want to say this. I'm going to stop sharing here for a minute. In closing, I'm going to say this. Have you ever heard uh, 
of a place called between a rock and a hard place? Have you ever heard of that expression? Between a rock and a hard place? Okay. Between, between a rock and a hard place. This is the place that we are being brought, the whole world, as, including Christians, we are being brought to a place that is similar or can be referred to between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, the powers of earth will decree that if you don't receive the mark, okay, if you don't receive it, you will be killed. On the other hand, God says, if you receive it, you're going to suffer the wrath, my wrath, unmingled, and you're not going to make it to heaven because you'll be deceived. I'll number you with the devil, and I'm, I'm going to destroy you in the end. So now you have to choose between the wrath of nations and the wrath of God. Which one would you rather avoid? That's of God. I, I would rather, the, Christ said this, do not fear him who can destroy the body that cannot destroy the soul. Rather fear him, that's God, who can destroy both the soul and the body. So there is a place we're going to be brought to. The children of Israel suffered in Egypt. When Moses went and they told Pharaoh, let them go, he increased their labor. Amen? They put their lamb, the blood on the, on, the, on the doorposts, and at last, even though they had suffered all along, when the death angel killed the firstborn, he passed over their houses. Are you with me? Right now. That's the Passover, right? Right now, that's the Passover. Right now, my friends, even here as we're talking, there are angels silently watching and listening. What do we do with God's message when we hear it? What are we going to do with it? Are we going to study convenience? Are we going to keep up with the light that's being given to us? Are we going to obey God, choose to obey God rather than man? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What is your choice? That is a choice that I encourage you to make along the way. Every study we have, and you see that it's biblical, if you have questions, ask them. If it's clear, acknowledge it, and take a hold of that truth and live it. Amen? You move along, you hear it, say, Lord, that's your truth. Let it be unto me according to your word, and you move on. If you're doing that along the way, it'll not be a challenge at all. If you're not acknowledging the truth that we're reading, you're going to find that I'm going to bring up something two weeks from now that we studied today. You're going to like, where did we study that? Because you're not acting upon it. Amen? Now, I'm going to stop right there. Uh, and uh, I'm going to entertain any questions we might have. And then we're going to close. And I'm going to tell you right now, while you're thinking about any questions you might have, next week, um, save the password for this Zoom meeting. Yeah, everyone. Okay, yeah, there's a message there that John sent to everyone that's listening, the password. He has sent that as a message there. So if you click it, you'll see it. Save it, and you'll be able to join the meeting whenever we get together. Uh, so next week, we are going to look at, I'm thinking here quickly, we are going to look at the three, the message of three angels. Remember that message we read of the, the angel that is warning? Okay, in chapter 14, it's the gospel given by three angels, okay? It is the last message to be given to the world, and it's given, it's a threefold message. We're going to start looking at it next week. The message of three angels, okay? Uh, go ahead and, and read Revelation 14. It's very short. Uh, we're going to be looking at it. Uh, and... Um, and uh, especially from verse 6, okay? We're going to be especially particularly looking at verses 6 to 14, okay? 6 to 14. Let us pray together. Let's bow our heads, and we're going to pray together. Let me see. I'm going to pick on someone to pray for us today. All right. So let's see. Who's that? Who's going to be that? Oh! Shauna, I'm going to ask Jason to pray for us today in closing. Okay, he's here. All right. Yeah. All right, so Lord, we just gave him before you tonight. And we thank you, God, that uh, we're getting into the word. And well, whether we accept it or don't accept it or whatever, we're on the path. And we're discovering and learning different things. And so help us to understand um, 
your word and able to break up down your word and spend time in your word. And I thank you, Lord, that, um, you know, the last couple of Bible studies, I actually have been digging into the word, Shauna and I, and, and reading it, and not just revelations, but, you know, other books as well. And so we thank you and uh, praise you in Jesus name. Tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 All right, my friends, uh, have yourself a good night. Uh, we are pretty much done with some of these stuff that uh, takes so much of our time here. I recognize that we leave a little late, you know, but I promise you starting next week, we'll go back. We'll go back. <laughs>